Hello again. Uh, this is last panel of our conference, Invisibles, Diversity in Culture and Creative Industries. Uh, this last panel is called Towards Different Kind of Diversity. Uh, so we envisioned it as a, as a kind of summary of the presentations that we heard at the conference, uh, but also as a short presentation of, of the highlights uh, of the research, time and risk, produce quality. So our starting, pro uh, starting question with uh, this project, Diversity Mixer, was uh, what is real diversity and can it be managed? So we don't have answer yet, but we have preliminary uh, re results of the research. Uh, and we heard lots of interesting people uh, giving their uh, thoughts and the definition and ideas about the diversity from different areas. Uh, from theoretical perspective, from gaming industry, from music industry, uh, from theater and film. So I would ask now uh, researchers from University of Rijeka uh, to present us uh, not the whole research, but maybe highlights, main, main highlights from the research time and risk produce quality. Lev Manovich's talk, um, he was uh, discussing and uh, um, trying to, to uh, make us uh, visible uh, his uh, um, understanding of uh, um, diversity uh, through uh, this new media and communication sciences dimension. And uh, while he was uh, uh, giving his talk, uh, I just uh, briefly went through, uh, let's say, abstract of the uh, most recent research he did. And the first sentence uh, uh, that opens the, the abstract is, uh, what is the intention of the uh, research? And it starts, we, uh, we want to analyze, um, then uh, give the metrics, uh, measure and visualize uh, the big data, which is okay uh, from some cultural, very broad cultural perspective. But if we do go into research or methodology, uh, something is like missing. Uh, maybe we should start with the collecting data, then measuring data, then analyzing data, and then visualizing data. So I'm not objecting uh, Manovich's uh, intentions. I'm just uh, trying to uh, now make a room for what we did in our research, because we wanted to give some epistemic value uh, to uh, what we've uh, done, uh, which is uh, we, we wanted to investigate uh, the uh, art of uh, things, affairs of art of arts uh, in, in uh, culture and creative industries uh, in Rijeka and in the county. And uh, uh, by doing that, uh, we proceeded with the certain methodologies uh, which uh, Christina will tell us more about, and then Marco Luca will tell us uh, more uh, about some um, paradoxes and aspects of um, matching uh, the quality and uh, the standard, uh, whatever the standard is. And uh, Christina will tell us uh, more precisely about the time and the risk. Uh, which is the title also of, or um, rather a quote uh, from one of our interviews uh, that we've got, uh, time and risk create quality. And uh, Marin didn't discover uh, what he's going to talk about, but he'll say something clever, <laughs> nevertheless. <laughs> yeah, correct. No, he's, he's uh, the, the accomplice, uh, so uh, I don't even doubt in his judgment. Uh, Christina. Okay, thank you. 
All right, so um, I will uh, present you short, shortly the methodology uh, of this research process. It's not only one phase, it's actually had three phases. Um, I talked about it shortly in quantitative data uh, uh, presentation uh, on the first day of conference, but now I will go into more depth. And so, uh, firstly, I just want to reflect on what you were talking about when you talked about big data. So why quantification can be problematic sometimes. So uh, you may or may not be aware that um, there is a current replication crisis in, in science. Uh, actually, that, that basically means that many data that we have uh, and from many research do not replicate. So when we repeat the process, we do not get the same results. So I, who, I, who am personally a researcher with uh, over a decade, decade of experience in quantitative research, I advise you to take every quantitative da data with a grain of salt. So this is why we did not start with um, just replicating uh, some um, survey uh, about uh, culture and creative industries from EU, from um, USA, just to uh, uh, replicate it here in Croatia, but we did it differently. So. Uh, we first we explored the policies that are already there, so the EU level policies uh, uh, about culture and creative industries and diversities, uh, diversity in culture and creative industries. Then we wanted to see how uh, what do we have on uh, on our national level because. As we all know, it's not the same to talk about CCI or diversity in, uh, in Europe and in, in Germany and in Croatia. Um, so we, we analyzed that and then we went to the local level of local policies and uh, to see what we, what we have there. Uh, just to check how the policies are used and um, what is going on in practice we then went and looked for good practices that actually um, show the, uh, how we actually understand diversity in CCI and how we uh, integrate it in our practices. So this was our first report that, that was actually, um, which is called Good Practices in CCI, which was the first step of, of this research project. Then when we actually saw what's, what's going on on that level, we decided to go and ask uh, 20 people uh, who are uh, CCI workers in Rijeka and our county. So uh, we, and we were very careful about sampling. So we didn't want to have only uh, the experts who are top level, who are uh, leaders of institutions, but we mixed it up. So we had, people who are decision makers, people who are working in big institutions, and we also had people who are at the beginning of their career, uh, who are, let's say, more struggling to, to find their path, uh, but are still CCI workers, and you know, they're someone whom we expect to see more in the future. Uh, so we asked them, uh, what about CCI, how they understand? Uh, creativity, how they understand talent, how they understand, how, how they see education, role of education uh, in our context. Uh, what is their work condition, how they manage uh, to, to survive. Um, and uh, uh, then how they believe talents should be developed and how we should um, change our action to have um, more diverse and more quality, have more quality in CCI sector. Um, and from that phase, uh, we identified key topics that we want to explore further on and to quantify. So this is why when we talk about, uh, about numbers and about factors that we came up with, uh, we can talk with certainty, uh, not, be, not only because this is numbers and this is statistics, but also because we saw it in different levels of our analysis. And we can <laughs> say with certainty that uh, this is what we have in Rijeka. 
so um, what is very interesting to me, uh, so Mark and I had a very short conversation now before this panel, is that two of our factors that we found using principal component analysis um, is actually, are actually similar to something that, that he got in, in some other research. So I will just quickly uh, explain these two factors. Um, so one, what is factor analysis actually doing? It is, let's say, meta-analysis of, uh, of attitudes. So we can ask people how much they agree to uh, the statement that um, um, like talent is something people are born with. So we can measure that and we can show that. Uh, so, but factor analysis is doing something in behind. So it's, it's looking into which attitudes are grouped together, which attitudes are usually found in, in certain people, so, uh, or tend to appear together. So what we discovered is that the attitude, the, uh, uh, the opinion that talent is something that one is born with actually comes together with attitude that uh, like uh, institutions and people in power should dictate what the quality is. So like the experts know what the quality is and they should say if some artwork is good or not. Uh, so um, the other uh, factor, the other, let's say, side of, of the same thing is, is the attitude that actually um, what, uh, okay, uh, in order to get quality uh, and creativity, you need to risk, you need to let people in and um, uh, let them experiment. And even though you think this is not good, you should allow it to develop and to, and, and, uh, and this is when uh, the, some, something really new can happen. And this is the story about diversity. So uh, why is it important to, to have diversity? It's not uh, only because it's morally correct. It's okay for people to be allowed, for minorities, for, for different uh, vulnerable groups, which we all agree there is awareness in, 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 this, uh, in our local context that it's important. Uh, but what maybe we're not aware, this, this is the only way to really stay fresh, to really have new ideas, and um, something actually surprises us in the end. So maybe we can, we can talk about uh, accidentally stepping into something general there, like uh, with those two factors. So... This is, yeah, maybe you can comment on it. Plus Mark is, uh, it will be probably late for his bus or train. Uh, so maybe uh, maybe you can do your intervention and your recommendation actually now in, yeah. in exchange. Yeah, so um, I mean, one of the things that's been really interesting and sort of inspirational about this conference is obviously I've learned a lot about the Croatian context and the context of this part of the world and specificities, but I've also observed a number of things which we can see echoed both in other parts of, um, you know, Southeastern Europe, in Europe more generally, and, you know, more globally. So one of the things that's come through quite strongly from uh, some of the work that we've done and some of the work that everybody else has been done is that people like one of the big barriers to uh, transformations in diversity isn't it's partly structural but it's partly people's attitudes and people's attitudes tend to reflect the structures in which they find themselves and so it's you know it's partly for this reason that we see similar themes coming through in separate like in re, you know really brilliant panels on different sort of elements of the ccis different sectors of the ccis uh, that we've seen in the last couple of days and, in, and more generally in some of the techniques and methods that people have been applying. And so, yeah, in that way, it's been really interesting to see how, uh, for example, the work that Christine has been doing, but the work more generally that's been occurring, both tells us something specific about Croatia, and we need to understand Croatia as a unique environment, but nonetheless it echoes some stuff that we see in other parts of the world. 
Okay, this was Mark uh, Taylor from University of Sheffield. He had great, great presentation. Uh, first day of the conference, you can find it online. Uh, uh, the research is called A Panic, Social Class, Taste and Inequalities in Cultural and Creative Industries. Uh, and we continue now with Mark Lukas uh, uh, part of the research group from University of Rijeka. Thank you. Uh, so I would just focus very briefly on this question like of diversity, of the type of diversity that we're really interested in, and then sort of give some potential focuses for potential future policy interventions, nothing too concrete, but sort of general areas. Like, so first thing is this idea of ty which type of diversity is at stake, what is the question, and then we have, we can sort of understand three broad types, there are numerous others, so forth, but three broad which are of, of relevance here. First would be this diversity on t in terms of, let's call it identity diversity in the sense of gender, race, and so forth, which is outstandingly important, it's extremely important to, to have this kind of diversity in the cultural sector, in any sector. Second would be this idea of diversity in terms of uh, social economic inequalities, which is extremely relevant and which tends to, which also Mark uh, uh, mentioned in his presentation, which is a sort of a strong, strong uh, type of diversity that needs to be accounted for. And the sort of third one, which we were even, which tends to be somewhat disregarded and which Christina already basically mentioned, is something that we could call for instance, evaluative diversity. It is a diversity in the sense of, uh, in the sense of the whole conceptual structure of what we find to be a valuable contribution to the cultural field. So, in order to sort of illustrate this, this is this is sort of a theoretical basis that we also saw reflected in the in the interviews with our interlocutors from uh, CCIs in. Uh, two distinct sort of fields. First was the idea of uh, something that I like to refer to as the administrative turn in CCI. It is this sort of moment where the majority of the CCI workers' time and energy is devoted to administrative uh, work. And the administrative work in some senses, in relevant sense, dictates the content that you can produce within the cultural creative industries which our interlocutors found uh, strongly reflected on the question of quality. Thus, this sort of strong standardization went hand in hand with reduction in quality in CCI. And here we can see that the other, other side would essentially mean that the larger diversity of these evaluative measures would respond to, uh, would respond to some kind of change in quality. The other hand, on the other hand, is the question of, of talent, which, so in this, in this sense, what is relevant is that diversity does not only include, uh, as I said, extremely relevant cultural and so forth, diversity, but also this risk taking of taking in those producers, those uh, ideas and content which, we, which do not meet certain, pre, you know, uh, pre-reflected expert standard derived from some institutional top-down uh, criteria. The other part is uh, the talent and the idea of recognizing talent early on and then nurturing, which, which is extremely important. But the other side of that is the idea that uh, you can miss a lot of potential contributors which do not essentially uh, uh, exhibit those kinds of talent that you, by your standards, are already recognized as the standard according to which you claim something to be valuable. Sort of a, maybe Baroque at, the, at its beginnings was trashed for most people. This, would, this is the, the basic idea of that our interlocutors, that a new, like a number of them repeated. Um, in some sort of general, uh, potential policy directions in sense of institutional responses to these questions. First is, of course, education that was mentioned time and time again. Education in, in numerous ways, but even our interlocutors, and we tend to agree with this, uh, found that the CCI education 
for CCI does not necessarily mean or shouldn't stress the technical aspect of being great at a certain craft as much as it should reflect capabilities of independent thinking and so forth, certain general uh, capabilities of creativity, of engaging with those that we disagree with and so forth. Um, the second sort of, second issue that requires institutional response, and this is, it is complex, it's not clear at this point, at least not to me, how, how this institutional response should be uh, developed is a sort of ethos in the sense of specific actors and the specific ethos within the field. And this ethos is, uh, of course, reflected in the sense, for instance, when we had this, the, one of the most intriguing findings in the, in the quantitative part was that uh, while like eight out of 10, I think, uh, people would say that diversity is good for the profession in CCI, the much larger number, I'm not uh, completely sure, but a relatively small number believe that public funds should go towards including diverse people. So this is a sort of fundamental paradox of our quantitative uh, uh, research. And in this sense, you have this sort of ethos moment when you say the right things, but you don't actually follow through with the, with the full allegiance to some institutional response to this and you don't follow through with the thinking that then you need to fund primarily the inclusion of diverse in these sort of three categories. On the other hand, there is also this, uh, what I found to be intriguing uh, is this idea of, of fixating on the, on the amount of work that is given into uh, CCI sort of uh, this high engagement, intrinsic motivation and so forth, which can lead essentially to inability to actually change the field because you do not have the sort of uh, the, the possibility of some kind of solidarity and so forth uh, is quite diminished if our personal ethos is I will die for this artwork. Then you sort of diminish the possibility that those who, who are not ready to die for it, who do not have the time, financial, blah, 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 uh, capabilities to do so, you're sort of closing the door to them. And there are other points, but this is more or less it that I would like to say now. Thank you. Thank you. Christina. Thank you. Um, I have some, a bit like, a mode of thinking about Marco Luca's words because I just have two points that kind of um, go in the lines of uh, time and standardization. So and basically what we did, the research, the, the report title is uh, Time and Risk Produce Quality. I'd say time and risk and research produce quality in this case uh, of uh, what we did in the project. So looking back on our research process, uh, the intelligence, the truths behind the answers and the silences of our interviewees, we had 21 people, uh, were considerable and also intriguing in a way. And uh, they would say things like, oh, this is a first, this is a first time somebody asked us, uh, the experts, uh, the people working in the field, you know, what you think about this and that, how do you work here, what would you say it was all about? And the research itself uh, could have been even bigger, more ambitious, more time consuming, more revealing for us. And uh, more importantly, we could have found out more if we had more time, of course, but this is the project nature, you do things in a timetable. So the, the curiosity of our work grows, we find blind spots, we uncover them, and you get more creative in turn what you can do with it. So I was thinking this morning like huge projects like ECOC 2020 uh, may need to rely on some truths, truths that are more useful to stumble upon in the early stages of the 
uh, thing, the beast, uh, in the beginning of the time, the project time. And so in the beginning there was research, that's what I said. And then risks and then maybe some quality happens in the end. And um, also this time we spent can provide us with some surprises. Marco Luca and Cristina said that. Also, uh, some incidents can happen and some creativity can incorporate in the latter stages of the project, of the thinking process of uh, leading to a more intelligent and useful designs, more creative, uh, diverse field we work in. So, because the assumptions of the most successful, actually, managers in culture, uh, do have blind spots and they can be misleading so and can cost us time and money and human resources and uh, which could you know you can do it better if you just start with research also about time and risks and quality a lot was said about the standardization in culture, so that the production of highly cultural products, uh, highly high quality cultural products, sorry, by the right people with right, you know, CVs, credentials, and such, uh, the most educated creatives, the best in the field, who managed to get in the field somehow in the first place. Uh, yeah, well, in time, maybe more time in Croatia than other parts of the world, but in time, you know, the proper standardization in the arts can happen and can really be given to the artificial intelligence, actually, authors, and uh, they can produce better quality pro products in the end. And uh, in truth, why wouldn't they? So uh, this can turn the tables in... Uh, in context of diversity and it can change the thinking of accepting and leaning and depending on diversity, the human diversity, with the ability to create these beautiful mistakes and if nothing, so that one, uh, one of the points was to uh, make the right to make mistakes in our research and give space to making mistakes and the uh, means of getting ahead in the creative process of any kind of thinking was due to the space of making mistakes by humans. And this may very well be fostered by curating diversity policies in, um, in time ahead. Actually, right now, but in time ahead. And now a bomb. <laughs> well, no, not, not a bomb, thank you. Uh, so yeah, we, we, we talked uh, during these three days a lot about uh, education. Obviously, we come from the university, so we think about, okay, so how can we fix it? Should we fix it? And from the um, research, we got that, you know, some things are obviously not working with uh, the educational system. Uh, but it was all, all so focused on higher education for some reason. Or maybe we read it as focused on higher education. Uh, and, and uh, somehow we slipped in this research, uh, which I think is our mistake. Uh, we we lost track of the uh, first two letters, like uh, the elementary school and the high school, uh, where a lot of people, a lot of things happen. What kind of art uh, do the kids see for the first time? What kind of culture do they? Uh, do they see and do they are they exposed to and do they explore? And will that open up? you know, possibilities for them to work in our field or in any field. So uh, those are some uh, uh, spaces that I see as, uh, as a possibility uh, to further expand uh, uh, this type of research. Uh, on the other side, there's a question of mistakes and, and we uh, delved, uh, uh, especially in the first text, uh, uh, a bit on this, you know, the possibility to make a mistake uh, allowing uh, mistakes leads to uh, better work in creative and culture industries and so on. But uh, the question that I don't have the answer to is, uh, can we allow mistakes in the educational sector? Uh, and, and how risky are they? And, and can, we, uh, can we 
you know, allow ourselves to explore and experiment and see, okay, ah, well, this isn't working. But of course, you can see that only after 10 or 20 years. So, you know, it's a costly, uh, it's a costly mistake. It's a very risky mistake to make. And, and from there, it comes down to, okay, so let's play it safe and let's have a safe uh, educational environment. And, you know, no, it's not going to be great, but it's better than, you know, not making a huge mistake and so on. So, uh, uh, you know, what's the, it's the question for you. It's not like uh, that we have a solution, although we'd like to uh, have one. Uh, uh, what you know, what what to do about that? So you know, if if this is true that time and risk produce quality, uh, and we say, okay, yeah, that's very applicable in the, in the creative and cultural industries. Uh, can we apply that in the in the educational uh, uh, sector? Or is it a chicken and the egg uh, uh, question? So there is a bomb for you. Thanks. <laughs> I have one amendment. It's a project-oriented research. So therefore, when Daniela and I created the project, when we uh, applied for funding, uh, we ought to specify what we are doing. And we were doing it only for the higher education. No, no, it's just a complementary to what you've said. It's not work in progress. It's not something that we are going to continue, uh, or rather we need to come back uh, to replicate it in more, uh, with, with more factors, with more, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, I wanted to make another point, which is uh, right on spot of what you think. We would like to see other research made in this field. And also, we would be very happy if uh, whoever is going to write the cultural strategy of Rijeka for the next six, seven, ten years, because this one uh, expires in 2020, uh, would kindly take into consideration our paper um, and also maybe we'd like to see the cultural strategy of the county which never happened uh, which we quote uh, so we hope you know to 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 be able that this paper will be able to uh, bring something to that discussion as well yeah and again just okay we don't talk at all <laughs> <laughs> that's our dialogue research dialogue no no because the first day and that was uh, I will introduce actually our uh, Yaka and Mila uh, also. We spoke about the structural uh, inequalities and uh, where are they coming from, uh, these structural things? Well, th they are coming from this, that you don't have this, uh, uh, Hannah mentioned me and reminded me of the expression, it's a cherry picking uh, uh, data that you have collect now and there, et cetera, et cetera. You need to have a continuity even if it's only a research continuity to make, uh, to build uh, your strategies, uh, to build uh, the, the projection of what you're going to develop. Uh, whatever it is, it's not, I'm, I'm not meticulous uh, when I'm saying this, it's just to have a continuity, whatever you do in any arts, in anything that you're doing. Okay, so I'm sure that this paper will be actually used in uh, drafting new cultural strategies, strategies of culture, uh, and it will be further used in our own work within Diversity Mixer project. Uh, so we consider this paper to, to be together with the presentations from this conference actually as a base, a basic findings uh, for our future work within Diversity Mixer project. And what we have now is uh, uh, our next step is actually diversity mixer working group. Uh, so we established this group and we had first uh, uh, introduction meeting yesterday. And the purpose of this group is actually to draft recommendation for diversity policies and practices in public and private sector in culture and creative industries. And our overall aim with this project is actually to influence uh, criteria for public funding of culture and creative industries on local, regional, and uh, national level. Uh, and uh, concerning city of Rijeka, we have their uh, strong support uh, from Department of Culture. Uh, that's why I want to ask now our speakers, uh, those who are still with us, uh, Sergen Laterza, Olga Dimitrievich, Jaka Primorac, and Milan Živković, uh, to give us uh, really short interventions, but in forms uh, of diversity recommendations. 
based as a, as as kind of summary of your own presentations uh, during the conference. We also have Sergeant Sandich with us, uh, who was guest at the conference with uh, Reading Theater uh, and also host of our conference. So maybe you can share also how diverse was this conference for you. Uh, let's start with Sarjan. Uh, he was here uh, on gaming panel, which was definitely the most Thank you. interactive <laughs> panel of the conference. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Lela. First of all, thank you, Lela, and all of your team for the great conference. Uh, we were very pleased. My colleagues and myself were very pleased with the interactive part of the of the uh, our panel because, as you probably know, in Croatia, people uh, are not likely to comment after a panel, and we were very surprised that during all of the panel, the people were commenting and giving some great feedback. Uh, and I guess, based on uh, what we were talking about and discussing, and based on those feedbacks, like some of the recommendation uh, that will involve interactive storytelling and gaming in general, uh, should focus now on a uh, very local uh, Croatian level. Uh, gaming industry and gaming culture, um, or gaming as a part of art here, is, so to say, in its infancy. So we have the opportunity to uh, make it more diverse now and maybe, uh, as uh, some of the commentators mentioned yesterday, not make the same mistakes as the uh, film industry made and take, you know, 100 plus years to include diversity in the content and in the workplace. So as a part of it, I guess, uh, very pr practical guidelines will be first uh, to um, uh, make... Uh, make uh, uh, to, to use the public funding which will be made available uh, this year and which was uh, uh, starting with last year made available to develop uh, video games with artistic elements. Uh, and also to uh, to start to stress that this is the uh, this is the field that uh, in general isn't uh, isn't uh, uh, positioned well here because uh, still when you say that you work in this field you, it's not considered to be the real job so I guess there is a uh, there is a lot of work here even in establishing the medium and the diversity within medium but also in establishing it uh, as the line of work as the workplace as uh, something uh, that uh, some line of work that can be unionized and that uh, can increase the rights of its workers. And uh, what was also in the end of the panel stressed by also uh, by some commentators was the uh, education in this field, which is also an emerging an emerging field in Croatia and Indian region. But it's been it's been worked on, and I guess. Mm, students that will be enrolling in universities in like say five years time will uh, maybe be empowered by the developed uh, developed educational pro uh, programs that will help them uh, empower themselves uh, also in making something innovative, uh, placing it on the global market, uh, but also be, be aware that uh, what is their role within the industry and how they can push push the boundaries of diversity in the medium, but also uh, in the uh, demographics of people that are making the games. Just to mention that uh, we had a sampling from gaming huh? in our sure. interviews. We, we did oh, great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's great. Okay. Circle, yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, well, what can I say uh, for the end uh, and also about theater and diversity and uh, uh, well, I can just start from what we also mentioned on the panel that uh, theater tends to be this uh, profession or art that presents itself as a very progressive one, uh, as uh, one that analyzes society so much, which makes political shows, which gives social commentary and so on. But actually, it really often, more often than not, just reproduces uh, um, all um, oppressive structures of, of the society and also its structural inequalities uh, within the uh, uh, theater, uh, as much uh, in theater system, uh, uh, in the theater system, uh, as well as within uh, the work process. 
Um, and that's also something that needs to be taken into the account when we talk about diversity in theater. I, uh, uh, any further attempts, uh, 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 I would say, should go in at least two directions. One recommendation would be for people in power in theater to actually try to think about their position and sort of emancipate themselves from uh, uh, all these, um, let's say, backward strategies uh, 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 in the field. But at the same time, since we know that people in power rarely give up their privileges, I would say that also uh, the wide, wide um, masses of theater practitioners who do not have access to institutions or to money so much uh, need to uh, look uh, towards uh, big um, social struggles of uh, 20th century, worker struggle, feminist struggle, and to actually uh, 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 see that they're not individuals as artists who are trying to get into the, the, the big system, uh, but uh, that they have a common cause to make the pressure from the bottom towards the, the, the top um, functioneers, so to say, uh, and never to stop with that kind of pressure because sometimes it actually uh, can give uh, results. Also, I would say the theater needs to think about diversifying uh, its audience that uh, 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 mainstream theater, I, now I'm really talking about mainstream theater where the money is somehow, uh, and uh, about diversifying its audience and also about diversifying its um, policies when it comes to repertoires, uh, uh, who is hired to act or to direct and um, somehow just to uh, uh, um, become more aware of its um, state building uh, 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 role uh, in the society that is still somehow unchanged since, I don't know which, 19th century or even before. Uh, I would just stop there. This was just more in general. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here and present kind of some of the ideas, but it's very kind of complicated and full of um, various uh, ideas and, and, uh, and um, reflections uh, on all the issues that we've been discussing for the last three days. But I think that when we're talking about kind of policy measures that we have to think about them in kind of on several different levels uh, and several kind of temporal, uh, I mean, parts, kind of um, policies, you know, that are long term, short -term term, middle term, etc. And I think kind of on the long term um, policies, I would connect with something that Magin has already mentioned, uh, maybe the policies for the access to culture, uh, for especially for the young, uh, would be kind of maybe the priority so that we are working towards building our audience and our workers diverse from the kind of very be beginning. Uh, then, kind of, uh, on the other hand, I think some of the policies that could be kind of applied more quickly are the ones connected to the education. So we can, for example, offer stipends for <coughs> arts and culture, uh, uh, cultural uh, artistic education, for example, on the county and the city level for the future, uh, for the future um, uh, students uh, that. And these uh, stipends could be based like criteria on the socioeconomic background or the gender issues or the minority issues, for example. That, that uh, type of uh, kind of policy measure that could uh, work towards the uh, diversity in the sector. And when you think about uh, Rijeka as a city and uh, Primorsko Goransk County, uh, I mean, you have to take into account this uh, small uh, small city, small county, and it has uh, limited capacities to kind of uh, be excellent in all the 
uh, cultural and creative uh, sectors. So maybe on the kind of policy level, a few sectors could be um, kind of uh, where you see that the capacities are kind of the, the best or, or could be developed, I don't know, maybe the film industry or the gaming industry could be as far as I kind of see from, uh, from some of the issues that we've been discussed could be kind of prioritized and then working within uh, these industries on the diversity uh, issues. Um, I don't know, maybe these are kind of my thoughts on, on, the, on, on the policy uh, interventions that could be maybe made uh, in, the, in the sector kind of on different type of levels. So I don't know, maybe just a few ideas. Thank you. It's me now, okay. Uh, quality, uh, as uh, uh, same as quantity, or pretty much everything in the real world is produced by uh, human labor. And I believe that uh, it has to be, it deserves to be better paid, especially in, uh, in culture and creative industries, and in academia and education and intellectual work too. Uh, so uh, it was really inspiring to hear uh, your insights on uh, this research. I mean, uh, it's it's very valuable, and, and it really, it's really, you know, the best approach to any sort of policy. Because you know, let's be honest, most of the time the policy, uh, not just in this country or this city, but all over the place, is uh, designed uh, uh, from the starting point, uh, which policy will be the best. Uh, to keep the mayor or president or prince in place, which will which policy will ensure that he will get the power or, and stay there for as long as he thinks he deserves. Uh, but if you if you would like to create policy for uh, for uh, for the embetterment of all of us, uh, the people, uh, uh, these uh, these uh, who create quality and quantity and everything then you have to start with research and you uh, uh, started uh, just from that starting point and 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 that's very valuable experience if everyone uh, in in Rijeka and in Croatia and European Union will create policies with your approach uh, we, we will live in a, a more difference friendly world so uh, if it, if it, uh, if our point of departure is cultural diversity, then our goal obviously is a difference-friendly uh, difference world. Uh, normative presumption of that approach is that uh, uh, difference is good. It's good to have different uh, nationalities. It's good to have different races in the room, different sexualities, different gender orientations. That's all, uh, that's all good that, that makes our hearts sing. Well, uh, the thing with that approach is that it may imply that economic inequality, difference in, in the income is also good, but it's not. If, if you too believe that it's not, you can, you can join really our struggles uh, for better pay of, of, uh, of cultural labor, uh, so we together can join uh, uh, working classes of this country and of the world for, for their better working conditions. If you, if you will need some theory, uh, some theory for that approach, uh, my offer was very modest, uh, but I think very inspiring still. It was Nancy Fraser's uh, uh, work uh, on social justice uh, in the age of identity politics, recognition and redistribution. Nancy Fraser tells us that we, you, cannot, you cannot conceive uh, recogni uh, recognition of identities without, without giving some redis economic redistribution. If you need a theory to help you orientate in a, in a hard time, uh, when you feel lonely, if you, if you need some piece, of, some piece of intellectual work to feed your heart, then please go for Na Nancy Fraser. Thank you. My turn. <clears throat> so since I was a host and I do a lot of moderation in Zagreb also, uh, and it's always in a way about diversity and that's my ideology, that's what I do. I have two minority identities, 
I can't <laughs> talk about anything else. But <laughs> every time I invite people and um, try to talk about that, and even uh, experience of this conference is uh, forcing me to ask the same question, and that's maybe a critique uh, to to all of us. Like, where are those people uh, who we want to talk to? Those minorities, those groups who are making this whole diversity program possible. We are talking about them, but there are no them. Only white, rich people. <laughs> or less rich. You know what I mean? And Croats. No, only white. And 99% heterosexual. <laughs> and you have horrible grinder in there. <laughs> Which means you're all straight. <laughs> No, I'm kidding. But uh, seriously, <laughs> uh, every time I try to think about about uh, diversity, uh, I can't be, I can't not be remembered on on how homogenic this country is and how absurd it is to talk diversity when there is no different identities. Like how many people are Croats declaring every time and Catholics uh, in, in this country. We're talking uh, really about small, small, small groups. So we are very romantic. <laughs> and that's why we don't have the audience. I don't have the audience in, in Zagreb. Uh, I can't have it because there are no, no, no different identities interested in this kind of politics we are trying to affirm. That's my experience in Zagreb. I don't know how you're going to do it in Rijeka 2020, in 2020 actually, because we have to maybe bring some migrants to feel the real <laughs> diversity. <laughs> Otherwise, it's going to be about us all the time. Thank you. <laughs> now we should all comment on this. <laughs> Plus, plus, uh, uh, we somehow decided during the research, but also in, for example, Alice's presentation, since we are in Croatia, and since diversity in Croatia doesn't mean racial diversity, uh, and this would be main subject in, let's say, US and UK, uh, we decided to concentrate on social class and to think about diversity in these terms. Uh, generation, gender, and socially constructed disability. Uh, but it's too late now for these comments, Sergeant. Uh, no, really, we are we are a little bit short on time, and I want to thank uh, all of our speakers, uh, panelists, moderators for their contributions. Uh, I want to thank you, uh, beautiful, beautiful and knowledgeable audience, especially those of you who spent all three days with us. And I suggest we close now and we continue uh, talking and discussing uh, while having coffee and snacks that my colleagues have prepared. Thank you. <laughs>